Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion on the Biden administration and Israel, what can we expect? I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA, and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. I'm delighted that the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies is co-hosting this event with the Gildenhorn Institute for Israel Studies at the University of Maryland. <clears throat> Needless to say, the topic of this panel is extremely timely. Just a week ago, President Biden was inaugurated, and in the past couple of days, his Secretaries of State and Defense have been confirmed and his foreign policy team has been appointed. Before they've even started their jobs, there's been growing speculation in the media about the potential for tension and even conflict between the Biden administration and Israel, particularly over Iran's nuclear program. And just uh, on Tuesday, the Biden administration announced that it will restore diplomatic relations with the Palestinian Authority and resume U.S. aid to the Palestinians. It also reaffirmed its support for a, quote, mutually agreed two-state solution between Israel and the Palestinians. Although it's early days, it's already clear that the Biden administration will take a very different approach than the Trump administration did to some crucial issues of great concern to Israel. And this will certainly affect U.S.-Israel relations over at least the next four years. To discuss all of this, we have a stellar panel of experts from both Israel and the United States. And I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking. First, Scott Lesensky is a professor of Israel studies at the University of Maryland. He was a senior policy advisor on Israel, the Middle East, and Jewish affairs in the Obama administration. He spent part of his time in Israel, serving as a senior advisor to the US ambassador to Israel, Daniel Shapiro. And he previously served as a senior policy advisor to US ambassadors to the United Nations, focusing on Israel, the Palestinians, and Syria. He's also been a resident scholar at the US Institute of Peace and the Council on Foreign Relations. Next up is Ilan Goldenberg. He's a senior fellow and director of the Middle East Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. Before joining CNAS, Goldenberg served as the chief of staff to the special envoy for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations at the State Department. He's also a past senior professional staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and served as a special advisor on the Middle East and then as the Iran team chief, team chief in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. He's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Security Studies Program. Then we'll hear from Shira Efron. She's a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies in Israel, a special advisor on Israel with the RAND Corporation, and an adjunct scholar at the Modern War Institute at West Point, New York. Previously, she was a Middle East analyst at several think tanks, including the Center for American Progress and the Middle East Institute. And finally, we'll hear from Tamar Herman. She's the academic director of the Goodman Center for Public Opinion and Policy Research at the Israel Democracy Institute in Jerusalem. She heads the team which produces the annual Israeli Democracy Index and the monthly Israeli Voice Index. And for many years, she also produced the monthly Peace Index in collaboration with Professor Ephraim Yar of Tel Aviv University. Professor Herman is also a faculty member in the political science department at the Open University of Israel. She's previously taught at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and at Tel Aviv University. Before we get our discussion underway, I want to encourage uh, all of our audience members from all around the world, we have about uh, 20 different countries represented among our audience today, to please send in your questions using the Q&A function. Uh, I will be looking through those questions and we will have plenty of time to answer your questions in the second half of uh, this event. So let me begin, first of all, uh, by turning to our panelists. And I wanted to uh, ask each of them a, a question and give a, a short response, three to five minutes in, in response to uh, these initial questions. First of all, Dr. Lesensky, how do you think the US-Israel relationship is likely to change under a Biden administration? Uh, thank you. Uh, and I thank all the other speakers. And of course, UCLA, we're doing a Maryland UCLA uh, tag team today. I want to especially thank, I will embarrass myself and her, Tamar Herman, who I met in graduate school. Uh, I won't say what year. It is such a particular pleasure to join her on a panel, um, uh, as it is everyone else involved too, but a very special um, word of delight uh, to be joining Tamar. Um, uh, Dove, the, the relationship is going to change in profound ways. Profound ways. Um, before I explain what I what I mean by that, um, first I'll sort of complicate your question and say, well, you know, 
number one, it depends on your benchmark. If your benchmark for U.S.-Israel relations is the last four years, uh, the Trump presidency, well, um, then you're going to be in for a, a, a major uh, uh, shock to the system, and you'll probably consider the changes negative. Um, um, second, if your um, if your benchmark, or sorry, if your perspective is one about publics, how the American and Israeli publics relate to and feel the impacts of this relationship. Well, that's, that's itself a, a sort of a different realm. My comments, my answer to your question, Dev, is gonna focus more on how uh, governments and elites, perhaps Israelis, it affects the public more, but uh, I'm not gonna address the publics uh, as much. Um, uh, again, what's your benchmark? Are we talking about publics? Are we talking about elites? Are we talking about how the governments relate to each other? So there's some complications to your question. But in general, uh, uh, complicating factors and uh, fancy academic language aside, um, it will change in profound ways. Uh, first of all, why? Well, the Trump presidency, which we're, we're still absorbing uh, how to talk about it in the past tense, um, affected the U.S.-Israel relationship in three ways, uh, three ways that were um, very different from the past. Number one, the level of politicization of the relationship hit an all-time high. In fact, there are moments of the last four years where it seemed as if the relationship was entirely relegated to politics. And, and, and on the American side, I speak of domestic uh, politics, though there's an Israeli dimension as well. So the degree of politicization Sure, well, Bill, did Bill Clinton have donors uh, at peace, peace treaty signing ceremonies in the Arava? Did George Bush bring donors with him when he addressed the Knesset? If we had more time, Dev, I'd give you 99 examples of politics penetrating the relationship. But here I'm talking about degree. The degree of politicization of the relationship was profound, number one. Number two, the Trump administration on virtually every issue that has been at the forefront of the US as a relationship departed from the consensus. Clinton, Bush, Bush the son, Bush the father, um, uh, Obama, um, even other, um, uh, I'll call them the modern presidencies since uh, uh, Nixon and Ford, uh, positions on questions of relationships with the neighbors, settlements, the Golan Heights, Jerusalem, there were departures left, right, up, down a little bit, but largely um, US policy operated within a sort of consensus. Uh, and on many issues, all the ones I just mentioned and others, the Trump administration departed. So the degree of politicization, the departure from the consensus of American foreign policy. And third, I'll say something, it might surprise some of you, but I think there was a tremendous degree of neglect. We're only one week out, but the more we learn about this, this relationship, and I speak mostly from the American side, I'll defer to Shira tomorrow on the Israeli side, but the more we learn about the last four years, how it was conducted, where the president put his attention, where the chief stewards of this relationship put their attention, Friedman, Kushner, uh, uh, Greenblatt and others. Um, I think we're gonna discover a profound degree of neglect. Look at the visa waiver issue, look at trade. I'll give you half a dozen other examples later in the discussion if you want. Some issues, and I remember some of them very well because we were uh, uh, half, half, half the way to the finish line when I walked out on the 20th of January, 2017. And the issues sat, some of them neglected, some of them, it's less neglect than it's um, unfortunately the side of the Trump administration that really was not beneficial um, uh, to Israel, take the visa waiver issue. Uh, it, was a, it was a presidency, love it or hate it, that didn't promote open borders and open travel, that promoted closed borders and closed travel. So though I was quite optimistic in 2018, 2017, 2018, even into 2019, that the Israeli people would probably get the biggest boost they could ever get from an American administration, the visa waiver program, something very few Americans follow, but Israelis know well, uh, they didn't get it. And I suspect it was a combination of neglect as well as policy. So okay. I think there'll be profound differences. Um, 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 mostly, most, yeah, mostly I think to the benefit of American foreign policy and ultimately the benefit of both countries' interests. Um, anyway, I look forward to unpacking it further. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ilan Goldenberg. Uh, your question, is it inevitable that there will be a conflict between the Biden administration and Israel over rejoining the uh, Iran nuclear deal, as it's known, uh, more broadly over how to approach negotiations with Iran? Just uh, in the last couple of days, we had a pretty um, strong statement from the IDF chief of staff 
um, you know, coming out very strongly against rejoining uh, against the United States, rejoining the, the nuclear deal and even raising the possibility that Israel might consider a nuclear strike. So are we looking for a, a set for another kind of showdown, you know, like the Obama administration in Israel redux? Yeah, um, well, I think the answer is it's definitely not inevitable. Um, you know, I don't think the signs are are great. And obviously, there's been a lot of concern and, you know, stories uh, teeing this up. Uh, but I don't believe that uh, a Biden administration necessarily wants that early fight. Um, and it kind of is really up to Prime Minister Netanyahu and what he wants to do and the approach he wants to take. Um, I mean, just to pull back for a second, right? Uh, President Biden has said he will return to the JCPOA, uh, but also talked about making it longer and stronger, you know, dealing with some of the other issues, whether it's regional challenges, missiles, or extending sunset provisions. Um, you know, I think the Biden administration's approach to that is probably going to be, you know, first to go back into the deal. At least that's what he said publicly. Um, if Iran goes back into the deal, and then to look build on it, to build on that. You know, from the Israeli perspective, the biggest criticism and concern of that is their argument is, you know, this is that that the U.S. has a lot of leverage that have come from the Trump sanctions, and therefore we should use that leverage. I think that the response, and it's one that I believe and I tend to agree with where the Biden administration has been on this thus far, is to say, yes, you need leverage, and that's part of what you need for a negotiation, but you also need somebody you can actually talk to on the other side. And if you're not going to take any steps after unilaterally walking out of an agreement you already came to, you're not going to have anybody else to talk to. And I do think the reality is the U.S. still has a lot of leverage, even if it goes back into the JCPOA, because there's a lot of other sanctions that have not been lifted. If people go back to 2015 and 16, I mean, the Iranians were still struggling economically, even under the JCPOA. Um, there's a lot of things that are still on the table. Um, and there's the reality, I think, that, that the American domestic politics will not let the JCPOA just continue indefinitely into the future and all those negative scenarios that Israelis talk about we're not getting to 2030 with Iran able to do whatever it wants on its nuclear program um, without some kind of additional steps, de-escalatory measures, new deals, extensions, because the U.S. Congress and you know American politics will just never let that happen. So, so the question is like, does this make sense as a first step now? And so I think that's where the, the differences lie. Look, the early steps by the, the, right now, it's too early to tell how a U.S.-Iran negotiation is even gonna go. Um, Right. I mean, you don't really have the full team in place yet on the U.S. side. Uh, early on, the American position has been, you know, if Iran goes back in, we will go back in. The Iranian position has been if the U.S. goes back in, we will go back in. So that, that'll be unpacked over time and what that actually means um, and if there is a place. But it's also not a done deal that the U.S. and Iran can come to an agreement to go back in. Um, but even if they do, like I said, I think that the choice here is on both sides of the relationship, especially on the Israeli side. Right from the American side, it's very clear that President Biden doesn't want an early fight with Israel. You know, Secretary of State uh, Tony Blinken in his confirmation hearing was very clear that one of the first things the U.S. will do is consult with his allies and partners in Israel among them before it starts uh, engaging deeply with Iran on this issue. Um, you know, the president has a long history of working with Israel and a deep relationship there. So I think they'd be happy to work together. And look, there's a long history of the U.S. and Israel disagreeing about things and still finding a way to work together. Um, we don't we just don't always see things the same way. And that's just normal uh, between any two partners, especially Israel, a small country living a bunch of, you know, in, in a tough neighborhood and the U.S., um, which is a global superpower and has to view things differently. Um, and so, you know, from the Israeli side, um, I think you've seen some mixed messages. I mean, lately, the stories have been that the prime minister is more interested in at least trying things out quietly in the beginning. Um, and then you had this speech from the, you know, from the IDF chief of staff, which at least what I've seen in the Israeli media has come under a lot of criticism. Like people saying, like, we went out and did this without really having the. So I'm not really sure that that's necessarily the position of the Israeli government. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I think for both of us, for both both the U.S. and for Israel, the better approach is. We don't necessarily have to agree on everything, but it's so much better for both of us if we are quietly sitting in a room, aligning our positions, talking about our disagreements, finding ways to address them. If the U.S. can do a lot early to signal to Israel, it's not just about the JCPOA. It is about the region. We are going to do more. And if Israel can do things early on to signal to the United States, like we're not going to just pick a big political fight with you in Congress. There will be no big speeches going after the president in front of 
you know, the U.S. Congress, like we want to do this in partnership, even if we don't agree on everything. And and look, I was part of the Obama administration from 2009 to 2012 at the Pentagon working on Iran issues at a very sensitive time. And we found ways to work really well together. Like this is possible. It is doable, despite the fact that we had different threat perceptions and didn't agree on everything. And so, um, you know, I hope that we can go down that more constructive pathway and I think it's beneficial to both sides. It's also beneficial to Israel because I think it will have a lot more influence over American policy if it does that. Um, you know, but but it's also plausible we just go sort of down the pathway of back to 2015 um, with a very public, ugly fight. I really hope that's not where it where it lands. Um, but I think that that will harm both countries because Israel provides very valuable insight to the United States on Iran. And for Israel, if it really wants a voice in the room there has to be trust and there has to be a, a constructive working relationship. Um, and so we'll have to see where it goes. Okay, thank you. A lot to follow up on there. Um, now I'd like to turn to Shira Fon and uh, the other issue that's likely to, uh, to dominate uh, US-Israel relations in the next few years, of course, is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I wanna put a similar question to you. Is it inevitable um, or very likely at least that there's gonna be a conflict and tension between the Biden administration and Israel over uh, Israeli settlement building in the West Bank, uh, particularly and uh, more generally over US policy towards the Palestinians. Um, hi, Dov. Good evening from Tel Aviv to everyone. It's also really good to be here with friends and especially with UCLA. I don't know if people know, but I lived in Santa Monica uh, for nine years up until a, a little bit over a year ago. So I miss it very much. Um, to your question, and building on what Ilan just said, I don't think in conflict is inevitable, especially not on the Israeli-Palestinian front. Um, just because you look at what's on the, you know, White House agenda, it's not even the Middle East. And when we talk about the Middle East, it's definitely going to be the Iran file. Um, and I think, and I agree with you, with Ilan one hundred percent, that the Biden administration doesn't want doesn't want. Um, uh, a conflict with Israel on the issue on Iran, and it definitely does not want to open a second front from Israel on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is not even going to be a priority topic, not because the administration of the United States doesn't think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not important, it's just because the conditions have not changed fundamentally to, uh, to advance it, advance it as a top uh, policy issue. Um, and I think it's very illustrative, uh, the speech that maybe you saw that the um, that the acting uh, UN envoy, as US envoy to the UN, um, uh, gave to the UN um, Security Council the other day, um, which were not surprising at all, but in which basically he, um, he said, it's Richard Mills, he said that they're not gonna, the United States is not gonna start negotiations uh, between the parties. They're not gonna advance negotiations. This is not gonna be the priority. So, in a sense, there should be friction, right? It's not forcing Israel to the table and start negotiating on final status issues. Um, but he did indicate um, a, a desire to uh, restore bilateral diplomatic ties with the Palestinians, which have um, in practice not existed in the last three years, um, and restoring aid to the Palestinians, meaning also restoring ties with the Palestinian people, not just with the Palestinian people and uh, preserving the option, uh, keeping the window open for a two-state solution. On each of these things, friction with Israel is possible. So if you've been following those issues, there, there's a laundry list of steps, basically reversing some of the things that the Trump administration did. And those include reopening the PLO mission in Washington, which now hinges on legislat legislation um, in Congress. Uh, there is also reopening uh, an independent diplomatic mission that would um, represent for the Palestinians in East Jerusalem, which the Trump administration subsumed under the embassy to Israel. Um, these are not things that you would think could be contentions, uh, but they could become um, problematic. Not the PLO one, but especially one in Jerusalem after... With, with the U.S. Uh, recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, which is not a controversial in, it, in itself, and having an embassy there, there's a question, can they have another consulate in the city? And 
the United States can't just roll into a building in East Jerusalem, put up a flag and say, hey, we have a consulate. They need Israeli approval to do this. Uh, they need the approval for visas and they need approvals for security and a variety of other things. Will Israel uh, grant it? Uh, will Netanyahu be okay with it now that he's being challenged from the right? Uh, uh, I mean, for sure, right-wing candidates are going to say Netanyahu is dividing Jerusalem if they, he allows reopening um, a U.S. consulate in East Jerusalem. Um, it, it would depend. I, I don't think it would be wise on Israel's part uh, to open a front on that regard. But this is just, a, just an example. On the issue of settlements, which has been a friction point uh, in the past, both for Republicans and uh, uh, Democratic administrations. This was a bipartisan issue until the last administration. Um, it depends. I don't think the Biden administration wants um, to criticize Israel publicly on this issue. It, it's, it's, it's futile. It has no wins. Uh, it doesn't get the U.S. anywhere. The problem is that if they are serious about keeping the window open for a two-state solution, how do you do that with settlements, uh, with not saying anything about settlements um, that are one of the biggest hindrances to a two-state solution? And in that regard, I'm not going into international law, I'm not a legal expert, not all settlements are um, equal. Uh, there are settlements that would not make such a big difference if construction continues uh, all of the settlements that would remain as part of Israel if there's ever um, a division into two states. But there are, are other settlements, um, uh, E1, E2, we can go, it's around Jerusalem, uh, Atarot and Gibata Matos. Those, those are the four areas that have been the most contentious. It's because that building there could bifurcate uh, the West Bank and prevent the option of having a continued contiguous Palestinian state in the future. For 10 years, <laughs> nothing in those areas has been promoted. Um, very interestingly, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Gibat Matos, one of the most problematic areas, uh, tenders have been issued. The timing is not coincidental. And now there is a question, and you know, I welcome other, others' view on this. Um, what does it mean? It's not inevitable yet. Um, that there will be construction there, but it's becoming, uh, with every hour that passes, uh, more difficult to uh, reverse this uh, decision. And this is one of the first things that's going to land on President Biden's table. You know, what does what does what does he say? Uh, will there be a public condemnation, or will there be a public a private conversation between the two leaders when this conversation happens? Uh, interestingly, there hasn't been a conversation between Biden and Netanyahu yet, uh, which is telling, I think, in itself. Um, and say, you know, this is not acceptable. Um, I don't think they want a public feud on this, but uh, this could happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and finally, uh, Tamara Herman. Um, as an expert on Israeli public opinion, your knowledge of the survey data, how do Israelis uh, view the prospects of a Biden administration? How do they view President Biden? What are they expecting? And more broadly, how do they view the US-Israeli relationship? And are there major differences between kind of different social groups within Israel when it comes to uh, attitudes towards US-Israel relations? Okay, thank you, Dov. Uh, and indeed, the two major issues were already mentioned, the Iranian uh, problem, or, or uh, the Iranian opportunity, who knows? Uh, the Palestinian issue, which I'd like to expand later on, not in this round, and the issue of, which was not, not mentioned and is quite uh, uh, central in the debate in Israel, is the amount of influence of the more progressive parts of the Democratic Party on the Biden administration. To which extent is it going to be a captive audience of certain persona in, in the Democratic Party, which are looked upon uh, in Israel at least as uh, quite unfavorable uh, from the Israeli point of view. This was not mentioned and I think it should be taken into consideration. So we've been following Israeli public opinion on uh, the prospect uh, of the Biden administration. We started last June, in June 2020, and we asked who is the more preferable candidate 
as far as the Israeli, we mentioned it, the Israeli interest is concerned. So Trump got 56% and Biden got 17%, one seven, okay, which is quite similar to the results that we got before President Obama was elected. It was 16%. Now Biden is 1% more. We repeated this question in October and Trump actually increased his uh, popularity amongst Israelis, 63%, almost two thirds said, yes, we want Trump to be elected as the next American president. And Biden stayed with his 17%. Okay, so uh, there is not much uh, desire on the Israeli side uh, there was not that Biden uh, will be elected. And when we uh, segmented it by, um, uh, by uh, the uh, left, center, and right, I'll give you the proportions. The left is about 12, 1, 2, to 15, 1, 5 percent of the entire Israeli Jewish population. The Arabs are not really on the continuum between left and right. They are, are, are very different in, in, in their worldview. So um, uh, the, uh, uh, the percentage that, by, that uh, Trump got on the left was 40 percent, 4 zero. Uh, at the center, 55 percent, and on the right, 85 percent. So the right is 60 percent of the Israeli Jewish public, and 85 percent of them preferred in October that uh, uh, that. Trump will be re-elected as the American president. So it is quite clear who was uh, uh, the more desirable candidate before the election. Then we asked, um, in comparison to the Trump administration, is the Biden administration, this was in November, is going to be much more friendly, fairly more friendly, fairly less friendly, or not at all friendly? And then we got 65% saying that he, it, it is going to be a bit less or much less friendly towards Israel. So the expectation of this uh, uh, administration is quite negative. Israelis do expect it to be hostile or at least not very friendly towards Israel when we... Uh, uh, Protected by the left, right, and, and center, uh, only 15% of the left said that it will be more friendly than the Trump. Even amongst the left, only 15% thought that it was going to be more friendly. 8% in the center and only 3% uh, on the right. So even the left in Israel doesn't have much hope that the Biden administration will be more friendly. And of course, the question is, what does it mean to be more friendly? Is it giving Netanyahu everything that he wants uh, is more friendly or doing something for the sake of Israel future in the longer run? But, but we, we didn't specify. And then, and this is a critical question, we asked to which extent Israeli national security is going to be a central issue in the uh, formation of the Biden administration's policy about the Middle East. And here uh, we see uh, uh, a problem because almost 50% say that it's going to be redundant, that the Biden administration will not be highly concerned or even fairly concerned about uh, Israel's national security. And as you know, though now during the corona uh, period, people are more concerned about domestic issues, basically and traditionally security is the issue that Israelis are shaping their political worldview according uh, to. So if uh, the sense here is that um, it is going to be neglected by the Biden administration, uh, and, and Scott, it is much more important that security is neglected than the visa waiver was neglected during Trump's administration. So this means that uh, uh, if I was on, on, on the Biden administration, I, I would have said, first and foremost, give some positive signals uh, or some, uh, I would say, clear 
statement regarding your commitment to safeguard Israeli uh, security, because otherwise it would be very, very easy to harness Israeli public opinion against uh, 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 the American administration. And we'll see again all these uh, phenomena on the public opinion level that we saw during uh, President Obama's uh, uh, term, where Israelis, actually, when we asked them about it, they said, okay, Israeli and uh, or Israel-Americans or U.S. relations are basically positive, but here what we witness during the Obama term is an historical accident. And this is the term that was used by, by many Israelis at that time, an historical accident that will be over in a couple of years. Indeed, it was over in, 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 in the views, but I'm very much afraid that people are highly skeptical and unless the administration gives some very, very strong signals that the concern about security is a prime issue for it, then we are about to see some uh, reluctance to cooperate on, on many critical issues. Thank you. Can I squeeze in a quick uh, uh, response? Uh, well, can you just hold on? I, I want to just uh, follow up. Uh, I gave everybody a chance to respond in a minute, but... Um, I wanted to, to, to kind of follow up on, on a, a number of you have kind of emphasized areas where there can be cooperation, where, you know, sanity should prevail, where there is, there are common interests. Um, but of course, one of the X factors in all of this are domestic politics. Um, I think Tamar's comment kind of points to that. Um, and then this, domestic politics is always important, of course, in shaping uh, this relationship. Um, but in this particular year that we're in, uh, it seems to be especially um, challenging because this is a year in which not only Israel is about to have another election, and so there may be temptations on the part of Prime Minister Netanyahu and others to maybe have some sort of confrontation or, or use that to his political advantage. Um, there's also, of course, Palestinian elections, which uh, are going to force or necessitate, if they do take place, a response from the Biden administration. There are also, of course, Iranian elections, taking place this year as well. So um, I wonder if, if all of you can think about how these, this, this domestic political dynamic, the fact that elections will be taking place in, in Iran, in Israel, in most likely uh, the West Bank, Gaza, maybe East Jerusalem as well. How is that gonna kind of complicate uh, the uh, US-Israeli relationship and, and, and maybe um, pull the actors away from what might be, you know, rational good sense to actually playing to up toward their domestic audiences. Um, Can I squeeze in first? Um, I'm glad you, you tagged Tamar. What Tamar said at the end of what was a tremendous uh, contribution, I think, rooted in science and her own analysis, the question of expectations, as Tamar pointed to, the Israeli public expectations, it's absolutely why. Uh, she said signals, I would say, a, a reassurance strategy, or maybe it's just tactics these first few months, especially before the Israeli election. For the Biden administration to have a series of calculated moves, statements, could be visits, it's a laundry list of things. It's a smart team on the inside. Uh, they know how to do it. Uh, but to, to make a little bit of room, even amidst these emergencies, domestic and global right now, to have some signals for reassurance. But I'd also encourage, and I think I'll do it in my own uh, 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 circles, but for others who pay extra attention, for those who will watch this webinar and still want to dig deeper, look at uh, Tony Blinken's speech in the summer of 2016 when he went to Israel. Look at Vice President Biden, then Vice President Biden, March 2016. It was a visit. I was there as a diplomat. Watch him when he spoke with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. See the messages. Even go back and look at a Washington Post story about how the then Vice President, it wasn't broadcast publicly, but how he uh, weighed in on the UN Security Council vote. He was a dissenter at the end. So, I think you're inclined, I would point to Tamar, but everyone who's listening, I think you're inclined to have a new administration in America that is sensitive to that, to sending those signals. It's important that they're laid out and there's some forethought. There's so much crowding the agenda right now, but a quick strategy of, of reassurance. It not only hits elites, but it hits the Israeli public. American segments of our society are mobilized for sure, but nothing compares to Israel. Virtually the whole society is aware, feels a deep sense of, of as stakeholders in the U.S.-Israel alliance, uh, they're, they're impacted, they're mobilized, and they're heading into an election. Uh, so it's absolutely critical. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ilan. 
Sure. Well, just reacting in a couple of ways. One is just to also add, if you're looking at speeches, I'd look at Tony Blinken's confirmation hearing, where I think he was sending exactly the kind of signals that Tamara was talking about with some of the language he was using. Um, but, you know, th that's going to have to continue. Um, on, the, on the elections issue, yeah, I mean, I do think that this complicates things in a number of ways. Um, you know, from the Iranian side, uh, this election in June, you do, I think, you want to, if you're the U.S., try to get some kind of an agreement between now and June with Iran, whether it's a return to the JCPOA or something less than a full return to the JCPOA. You want to be on the pathway, um, <clears throat> not because, you know, the president and the foreign minister ultimately make the final decisions. They don't. The Supreme Leader does. Um, but the president and the foreign minister have a great deal of influence and they know the American team and they, I think, are sort of more internationalist in their perspective than some of their, you know, who might be coming next inside of Iran um, and, you know, and are more committed to nuclear negotiations than some of the folks who might be coming next. So there is a real incentive to sort of move relatively quickly, but, you know, of course, uh, the Israeli elections create an incentive to slow things down because, you know, I do think it could create extra incentives to have a sort of big fight if the U.S. starts moving on the Iran stuff while Israel is dealing with its own election. Um, there's also, I mean, counter incentives to not be presenting yourself as consistently in a, in a bad p place with the United States. Um, so I think, the, you know, Prime Minister and Yao and all of his, uh, you know, competitors, the numerous, numerous, numerous <laughs> competitors um, would have to make calculated decisions on like that. But, but it would all be better if it wasn't happening, if these things weren't all happening together. Um, you know, and then just one comment on the Palestinian elections. I do think we have to wait and see if those elections actually happen. This is the farthest that they've gotten. Um, this is meaningful, I think, where they are now. Um, you know, and so I don't want to just dismiss it and say it's not going to happen. But there's still a lot to be worked out um, for for how these things happen. Um, and I mean, I think the toughest question for the U.S. will be, and for Israel, will be, you know, how it deals with Hamas participation. Um, you know, and I think right now the PLO's position and the Fatah's position is like, if you're going to participate, you got to agree to like the three conditions, right? Which is, um, you know, recognition of Israel, you know, renunciation of violence, and, um, uh, you know, abiding by previous agreements. Um, now, is that too much and unrealistic? Um, possibly, probably. Um, can you, is there a way to roll some of those back? I think it's possible or some kind of sequencing. We don't have to have agreement on all three of those because um, you do have the reality of Hamas has to be part of, Hamas is part of Palestinian society. It has to be part of a unified Palestinian government, um, ultimately in some form or another. Um, it's a very challenging, hard question for the United States, for Israel and, and for others. But on the other hand, also important to remember, Israel is engaging directly with Hamas these days or, or indirectly. I mean, it's negotiating with Hamas on things like Gaza it's green lighting like millions of dollars coming from Qatar going through Israel into Gaza. So Israel has kind of accepted that there is a reality you have to deal with these people. Um, the question is like how and what's practical and what makes sense. It's very po complicated. It's very politically loaded, um, you know, and, and frankly, the Biden administration has more important things to deal with right now with, you know, COVID and the, and the economy and all these other challenges and I just don't see them spending a lot of time in the early months spinning up on how we deal with Hamas in an election. Like that doesn't seem to me to be high in their list. Um, and I wouldn't put it high in their list. So that's going to be an, another challenge in all this. I mean, and frankly, it's another challenge in, in everything. The reality that in these early months, um, Israel, the U.S.-Israel relationship is not going to be as high in the list as it, like Israelis are used to having it just because of the nature of the global emergency that we're facing. Um, and also, um, you know, this shift in Washington over the past few years to a greater focus on Asia and away from the Middle East towards great power competition towards, you know, China and Indo-Pacific. Um, and so with all those things happening, um, I think, you know, Israelis need to understand that, like, this is where kind of the broader American vision is moving. Israel will still be an incredibly close partner, you know, an ally and will matter, um, you know, to the United States um, and matters a great deal to the Biden administration. But I just think that, you know, where it falls on the list right now compared with everything this new president is dealing with, not to mention rebuilding, you know, our basic sort of institutions 
and everything else, probably is not going to be as high as it usually is. Absolutely. I think the problem or the challenge is, of course, that uh, the Biden administration does, doesn't have the luxury of time with all of these uh, developments happening. And as Sheila was mentioning in, in her initial remarks with the, the announcement of plans to you know, start construction in Dubat Hamatos, for example, is just one of many indications of you know, things move forward and things happen, whether or not it's going to suit the Biden administration's uh, agenda or, or, or inclinations. Shira, can you um, perhaps weigh in on this and, and how you see these kind of domestic politics um, and, and particularly these, these multiple elections um, challenging uh, both Israel and the US and Biden administration in terms of their ability to deal simultaneously with all of these developments? Sure. So, so, I mean, they're not all related, but they're all uh, influential. And I think, you know, I'll defer to Ilan on this, but I'll start with the one I'll speak about the less, which is the least, which is the Iranian elections, which, you know, there is a push for hard lines there. And to think that what Iran has endured under the Trump administration, those crippling sanctions, now they're just going to be more flexible ahead of elections. Um, that makes it very complicated to square the circle and find something that can work with Iran the U.S., with the European, and with Israel. And, you know, Israel tries to portray as if it's 100% aligned with its new friends in the, in the, the Gulf, but it's not. They have different interests, uh, and which partially stem from, you know, location, geography, it does matter. So I think this, this is going to be complicated. I, I just want to respond to what others have said. Scott, I agree with you 100% on reassurances. And, you know, in 2007, uh, 2008, I was working at CAP at the time, and we wrote about the need for Obama to have these reassurances. And maybe now, after the Israelis and people are joking that Israel uh, is waking up to a hangover right after the Trump administration that was basically like <laughs> open door. Um, but we need to remember that no matter what Biden is going to do, the next four years, running up to 2024, you're going to have every Republican contender come to Israel and visit when they can fly again, sip wine in settlements, which Republicans never used to do before, and um, say how anti-Israel Biden is. It's going to be very, very difficult for this administration to show reassurances because, as Tamar showed with her data, I mean, there is a bias toward a more conservative thing. The professionals... There's no question the professionals in the, the defense establishment, they know and everyone values the U.S. strategic uh, Israeli relations. But those that, that if you talk about the public, the public, most of the public cares only about domestic issues. And those that care about those messages on the settlements, they have, uh, uh, it will be very hard to, to uh, reassure them. I'll just give you a few, a few, um, this, are, this is not data points, it's just, just, just afterwards. But um, when uh, Biden uh, um, was, was, was elected, you had Dani Dayan, a, a former head of the Asha Council, obviously an uh, Israeli consul general in New York and now part of the uh, Gidon Saar party. He tweeted in Hebrew, not in English. He was smart enough to not do it in, in English, but he said, oh, I'm looking now. And I, I don't remember the list of names he had there. He had Ben Rhodes and a few others. I don't remember if he had Rob Malley. And there's a very cruel, uh, unfair smear campaign against an individual now. Um, on this issue by the Israeli right and some Republicans. Um, he said, oh, it's really good. I, it's, it's not too bad because uh, John Kerry is now going to deal with the hole in the ozone layer. So we're fine. Uh, this is, you know, a little bit telling of where the mindset is. Um, and, and, and this is, this is going to be challenging. On the Israeli elections, it's for the first time that Netanyahu is being challenged seriously from the right. And there are indications that it's going to be hard for him to show that he's more on the right. And this is where it might actually be beneficial for Israeli-U.S. relations, because he's not going to, maybe he's going to be like, sure, you want to reopen the Council of Jerusalem, here you go. And I will be kind enough to not award contracts in Kibat uh, give me some concessions in other places. Uh, there's some indications that he's turning more to the left and, and, uh, and marketing himself as a peacemaker. Uh, but who knows? You know, this is going to be interesting. Final on the Palestinian elections, uh, Ilan is 100% right. I heard a Palestinian analyst giving a chance of 30% now for these elections actually taking place. I think that's that's pretty generous. It's closest we're, we're, where we've been. Um, a lot of people are, are saying, oh, will Israel let the Palestinians uh, vote in East Jerusalem? There are 400,000 Palestinians in East Jerusalem. Um, 
I don't think that's the key question. I also know in Israel, we know that Israel usually doesn't say no. It says yes, but, and <laughs> places a lot of hurdles, making this very difficult. So this likely is going to happen. Uh, but for those of us who believe a two-state solution is still the best solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there's no question you have to connect Gaza and the West Bank, and Hamas is part of it. And just the uh, final point, Ilan said Israel negotiates with Hamas indirectly and enables the transfer of, uh, suit of cash. It's not just enables, I mean, those suitcases don't drive themselves from Ben Gurion Airport. The money comes in dollars. Israel actively <laughs> converts the money to shekels, which is both, both what's used in, uh, in Gaza. A lot of this money goes to poor people. A lot of it goes to capacity building. It goes directly to Hamas. Um, so uh, this is also something we have to keep in mind, as you want. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tamar, if you'd like to respond to anything you've heard and maybe um, say a little bit more about um, how Israeli public opinion today vis-a-vis -vis the US is very different than it was, you know, I think back to Rabin's time where it was that, you know, it was always believed that if you had a confrontation with the US or if you were seen to jeopardize US support for Israel, that was a domestic liability for an Israeli politician. Based upon what you're saying, it seems that that's no longer the case, that actually, you know, playing against the US can sometimes work for Israeli politicians, for ambitious ones. Well, basically, you know, there were many changes in Israeli political and electoral uh, uh, spectrum in, 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 in the last 10 or so years. So compare it with the early 1990s would be, I mean, not very helpful in, in order to understand what's happening right now. Uh, people are, are, are not uh, against the U.S., I mean, they might be reluctant to cooperate on, on, on certain issues. And I recall that when Netanyahu came back from his famous, you know, speech in Congress, which was so uh, unpleasant to many Americans, he was applauded in Israel by most of, of uh, the center to, to or the right-wing uh, parties because he said he showed some... Um, you know, national pride and so on and so forth. So people should take into consideration that sometimes conflict in the United with the United States are beneficial from the point of view of the specific Israeli uh, politicians. I'd like to differ uh, about Netanyahu being challenged from the right. I mean, unless Saar is considered to be a right to, to Netanyahu and on some uh, issues he is, and he's going to cooperate with Bennett uh, and, and Lieberman and maybe Yael Lapid in a way. So he will be more challenged from the center right and rather than uh, from the radical right. But I'd like to say a word about uh, settlements, two state solutions, and so on and so forth. These issues are uh, looked upon as uh, some leftovers of an unpleasant past. In order to promote anything in this direction, no packaging is required. The way that no one can use anymore and hope for anything positive by saying this is similar to the Oslo process. I mean, Oslo is of state solution as such are off uh, the table of the public discourse in Israel. Even on the right, on, on the left, uh, people are talking about a one-state solution and uh, what have you, but the two-state solution is something that when people hear about it, it's like the uh, 80s uh, fashion or 90s fashion that no one wants. It's, it's still not a retro or a vintage, but uh, it is something that uh, creates some very negative reactions in, in people's hearts and minds. The same goes about uh, uh, settlements. When we ask, uh, we, we gave people a list of, of names of uh, towns and including settlements within and, and of course outside of the Green Line. People couldn't tell. Most Israelis were born after 67. When you say settlement, they don't understand what do you mean by that. For them, the neighborhoods around Jerusalem are part of Israel and they can't tell which neighborhood was or is uh, beyond the green line or within the green line. 
So also the rhetoric should be picked up very, very carefully in order not to create an image of some, you know, relaunching of some old campaigns for or, or against. The situation is different, the audience is different, and the language should be different as well. Pick up on that, uh, and uh, Ilan, you uh, recently co-authored, uh, I think, a, an excellent report putting forward recommendations. This is from the, your, from the Center for New American Security on, on, on how to approach the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and, um, you know, recommending, I believe, that the Biden administration should remain committed to a two-state solution but not try to relaunch peace talks anytime soon. Perhaps you'd like to just kind of respond to what uh, Tamar was just saying about how the Israeli public can, you know, seem to kind of move on from a two-state solution. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the part of the reason that we made the argument in the report was that the basic strategy was don't go pushing for negotiations now. Um, instead, try to take steps to actually curb the negative slide uh, and over time reverse it um, precisely, you know, and, and leave open the possibility for a two-state solution down the road, um, you know, precisely because uh, right now there just isn't really a belief in it on either side. Um, and so I think that's kind of the American interest position. Um, it seems to me, you know, the speech that we heard uh, just the other day uh, at the United Nations was quite consistent with that approach. Um, it was not focused on let's bring the parties back to the table, which has long been American policy and rhetoric. Um, it really was focused on let's rebuild the U.S.-Palestinian relationship. Let's look for, for opportunities to you know, improve the situation on the ground, the humanitarian situation in Gaza, for example, um, to build relationships between people. I think, for example, you know, between the two sides, I think there's a real disconnect between the two societies at this point. Um, the, the new Nita Lowy Fund um, is going to be a big U.S. effort, $250 million over five years to build people to people kind of contacts. I mean, I think there's a little bit of back to basics uh, for this conflict right now. Um, and so you got to sort of do those types of things while continuing to assert the position that the U.S. supports two states only because, you know, I don't really see any of the alternatives working either. And at least this one has this sort of international support behind it. Um, and I think that's kind of what we need to do for the moment to preserve the possibility and viability, um, you know, for the future. Uh, and so that's kind of what we lay out in the report, I think, in great detail with a lot of a lot more specific recommendations that I'm not going to go into in the, just the last few minutes of our discussion. Um, but that is the thinking. I do believe that's early indicators are, it seems to me like that's kind of where the Biden administration is going on this. Um, but I mean, part of that does mean deterring certain settlement activity. And that's going to be maybe the hardest question in all of this is how does the U.S. actually do that? Can it do that? Well, in, I think in your report, you, you talked about the need for the Palestinians to reunify and for the West Bank and Gaza to reunify and for there to be reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas. Um, so I'm, I'm going to put this to all of you. Would, the, would that, would the concrete kind of proposal therefore be that the Biden administration should be getting behind and supporting the Palestinian effort to hold elections and maybe pushing Israel to allow elections to take place in East Jerusalem. I mean, if this is one step toward a two-state solution, um, should, the, should the Biden administration be actually saying, this, uh, this chance for election must go forward, this is a good thing. It seems to be, as you've said, the best opportunity in years for there to be. There haven't been Palestinian elections in 15 years. Shira, maybe I see you're, you're, you, you have a response to this as well, so feel free to jump in. Let me, let me, so I'll, I'll start, but I'm sure others will, I'm sure share us. I mean, look, what we argue in the report, and I tend to believe it, at the end of the day, Palestinian politics is about Palestinians. So we, the U.S., don't need to be dictating outcomes. Neither does Israel. Um, you know, uh, it, it's on the Palestinians to figure a lot of this out. But, you know, we've actively worked against these types of things in the past. That was kind of the American position early on. Um, after encouraging elections that went haywire and wrong in 2006 with the Hamas victory, then, you know, Bush administration and early Obama administration basically like actively discouraged these types of things. Eventually, the Obama administration kind of shifted to a position of, you know, in 2014 of, you know, 
being agnostic about the whole thing. Um, and actually, I think even the Trump administration didn't really oppose unity conversations and dialogue between the two Palestinian factions. They didn't. They didn't get in the way of that. They kind of quietly supported it. Um, you know, and so what I would argue for is we don't have to be out front. We don't have to lead, but we can encourage um, and we can support where possible. I do think the East Jerusalem voting thing is not the poison pill unless the Palestinians want it to be the poison pill. Um, I think the much bigger challenges have to do with can Fatah and Hamas agree on, on an election, like what that looks like, like especially Hamas and Gaza, you know, and would it ever be willing to give up any, you know, power or, or allow a free and fair legitimate election to happen. Um, but I do think what you hear from even what I've heard from Palestinians on East Jerusalem is like, look, there's different ways to do this. Um, you know, millions and billions, millions of Americans voted by mail um, just, you know, a couple months ago. And there was some, you know, artificial controversy around it, but it worked out pretty well. Um, and so you don't have to have polling places rolling around East Jerusalem. You know, like there are ways to do this. And I think there's a, a willingness and openness to. And so I think that to me, the biggest issue is, you know, can Fatah and Hamas actually agree on something and actually try to hold some kind of free and fair elections? Can I tack on two quick yeah. points? Uh, so, anyway, I, I, I agree with uh, Ilan. First of all, it's a great report. I commend Ilan and, and uh, Michael Kaplow and Tammy Wittes. Um, I think the, the report actually has new packaging as Tamar. Um, it's a long report, but it has a nice snappy executive summary. So give everybody on the webinar some homework um, to read um, the report Ilan referenced. Um, on the election, I would just say, you know, this is now, this is a gray haired, um, this is a very experienced new administration. Um, and they'll be very aware of two things, two lessons from the last round of elections, which were when uh, Bush, second term of the Bush administration. One, uh, which is standards, Condi Rice and many others who were deeply involved in, in uh, the 2006 election, the Palestinian Legislative Council election. They say that, you know, they lowered the standards on, on, on you know, what we, the US and the international community would accept and would expect of the parties that participated. It's actually a sordid story, uh, an appeal from Abu Mazen, from President Abbas led the Americans to kind of lower the standards on you know, who could run. We should keep some distance, but we should be mindful of standards. And I can, uh, can't guarantee, but I think this administration will be mindful of that. And they'll also be mindful of not mucking around um, and not sending the wrong signal. Uh, there was a, a story I remember very well. I was uh, honored to join President Carter as an election observer and I was in a small town in the West Bank. I remember Salfit, the Northern West Bank, and I saw a billboard, Hamas billboard. It had just gone up a few days after a Washington Post story about some American State Department grants that were, they seemed to be a little bit under the table to try to help one party over another. The Hamas billboard said, the Americans have made their choice. Now it's time for you to make yours, <laughs> you know? So, you know, staying really distant from an election if it's triggered, but also uh, not letting go of the notion of standards. We're not gonna accept any, any outcome, any party with any position. Um, that's just, that's the way it is. And I think you can thread that needle. Um, Thank you, Shira. Do you wanna weigh in on this? I mean, just, just quickly, I think we talk a lot about the US on this, but uh, uh, the Europeans who have been the, the most important player in the Palestinian context, especially in the last few years, and been bankrolling the Palestinian Authority, especially since uh, Trump and Chicago late, they've been pushing for elections for a long, long time. Um, so there's, this is also something, and uh, we don't have time to get into it, but it also reflects like broader regional dynamics with Hamas's patrons, mostly Turkey, uh, being now uh, undermined. Uh, you can uh, think about the GCC, Qatari Agreement, Reconciliation Agreement with the UAE, and what it means about the Muslim Brotherhood uh, more generally. Hamas and uh, both Qatar and Turkey forced uh, Ismail Haniyeh to send a letter to Abu Mazen because they support Khaled Mashal, uh, who is a contender. So there's a lot of like inside stuff happening. I think there can be solutions because right, Hamas as a movement would not subscribe to the three conditions that Ilan uh, raised and those should be the conditions of the international community. Um, but uh, Hamas individuals can and this is what the, the basically Hamas leadership has said they can. Uh, they can go for a technocratic government if they want it. Uh, where there are a lot of talks about power sharing agreements and limiting um, uh, the share of, of Hamas, uh, 
the frustrating thing, I think, for all of us, that if you speak to Palestinians and you look at Palestinian polling, there's such um, uh, disappointment from both sides, from the two types of leaderships there. So it's sort of like, I'm not concerned so much about fair elections and not fair elections, and this Israeli, the, the Palestinian uh, vote in, in Jerusalem. If I remember correctly, last time Palestinians in Jerusalem voted, I think 3,000 people voted. So it's very, very minor. There's no interest in that. There's no such appetite for the public. And this is something we have to work with. Um, and I think what Bilan spoke about, the Nidalawi Fund and thinking about strengthening civil society, the Palestinian Front. And, you know, this, this, this can, can, um, can be really important and make a light in people's difference. And maybe one day also in the conflict, uh, even more so than the big strategic issues now. Thank you, Alana. I wonder if you you raised your hand if you wanted to respond to anything there. Yeah, I mean, just to say on the three conditions, I do think like one is more important than the other two, right? And the, and the condition that matters most is nonviolence. And if part of a of a, a agreement for a new election involves a long term stable ceasefire between Israel and Hamas and a real commitment to nonviolence, I think that just matters more than you know abiding by Oslo or even recognition of Israel. I mean. I mean, large parts of the Israeli, you know, current governing coalition don't support Oslo. So like, why are you gonna insist that Hamas support Oslo before you even let it in? I think, and I think the other point is Shira's point about, I agree, individuals versus parties, but, but you know, that is not a bad, if the deal is a long-term stable ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, um, and that is part of any, uh, any Palestinian election, that is a good deal for Israel, I think, that will make a, you know, I don't know if that's enough to get Israelis to, you know, support or be okay with it, but I think it could be a good deal for Israel, especially if Israeli government leadership wants to frame it that way. Thank you. Well, I want to now turn to questions that we've been getting from uh, the audience, and um, I'm going to kind of uh, pick and choose some of these questions, and I want to encourage our audience to keep sending them in. We, we'll, the rest of our time will be devoted to your questions. Um, so one question, um, a general question, but it's a, uh, I think about an interesting one. What do you think that the Trump administration did well in its relations with Israel that the Biden administration should continue? I mean, at the moment we talk, you know, the Biden administration is overturning uh, some of the decisions and actions made by the Trump administration, signaling uh, certainly with regard to the Palestinians, but also to a certain extent with regards to Iran, and it's going to take a different approach. What should the Biden administration keep? Uh, or what aspects, what, what, were the ben what were the good things that it might have learned uh, from the Trump administration? And this open to anyone here. I'll, I would say too, real quick, if you don't mind, I think the core security aspects of the relationship, the part the publics don't see, intelligence to intelligence and uh, 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 defense to defense ties. Of course, the MOU that President Obama negotiated, it's a 10-year one on top of President Bush, uh, Bush the son's prior one 10 years before, and Clinton 10 years before, so this pillar of security assistance. It got restructured a little bit under Obama, but you know it wasn't changed. Uh, Trump administration didn't muck around in that. So that core, and it partly speaks to Tamar and what she said about what Israelis are most attuned to. Um, we'll have an offline discussion about uh, what Shira said about the uh, drinking wine and settlements, but that if, if Tamar's statistics are right about that sort of, that core, that strongest element that Israelis are listening for, the security assurance, publics and elites, uh, the Trump administration, we saw continuity in that. They didn't try to rewrite it or renegotiate it. That's number one. And number two, I'd say the Abraham Accords. Um, I think they're going to get rebranded, uh, partly because the brand is a soiled and damaged brand, but I'll call it the normalization agreements. Uh, we've already heard from the leaders of this new administration and um, those elected and those in the cabinet, they want, want to continue and will invest in them. And um, uh, I think those are two, those are two both very important the legacies, though, you know, most of what I said in my earlier remarks are uh, the, the problems and the departures, uh, the discontinuities in the U.S. as a relationship, but there are some, some positive elements uh, I would acknowledge. So just on the Abraham Accords or these normalization agreements, which in, in, in many ways perhaps are the most significant diplomatic achievement that the Trump administration had uh, in the Middle East, if not in the world, um, how do you see the, the recently announced decision to review the arm, the sale of F-35 fighter jets uh, to Israel. Is this, uh, is this just, um, you know, standard practice for an incoming administration? 
Or could this review of arms sales perhaps signal to the UAE and to the Saudis that maybe, you know, uh, there isn't going to be business as usual? And, and, and could this even potentially uh, disrupt the normalization agreements, uh, or in particular between the UAE and Israel? Can I, I mean, I'll hop in for, for a second on this. Um, you know, I think it's a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B. I mean, look, the, 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 the arms agreement, the arms sale agreements uh, that, were, that were signed, I mean, some of them were signed like in the hours on January 20th before, you know, President Biden took over. Um, so of course they were gonna be reviewed. Uh, there were votes in the US Senate and Congress where there was pretty much unified Democratic Party opposition to some of these sales. Um, and so, yes, uh, the, 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 there was an intentional signal, I think, in putting a pause on them and saying like, you know, the days of the Trump administration, green light on everything, blank check are over. Um, but also I think it's important to remember that just in the, in the way that the relationship between the US and Israel was so unusual under the, under the Trump administration, so is the US Gulf relationship. Um, you know, I mean, we've, the US has traditionally like had strong security cooperations and these arms sales have been a regular thing. Um, but also there's been some holding to accountability on issues we disagree on. And with the Gulf states under Trump, it really was like whatever you want, free for all and everything. Um, you know, and, and that was new and unusual and different. The fact that he went to Saudi Arabia first of all the countries in the world. I mean, what a what a powerful message. And I don't think the right message, frankly, especially to, you know, close traditional European allies, for example, um, it sent. And so um, so I do think that on the one hand, there is going to be a bit of a rethink, especially with the Saudis, um, less so with the Emiratis, um, because I think there's a difference in their behavior, their reliability, you know, um, but at the same time, I'm not sure. So they're going to review it all. Um, but I don't know exactly how that turns out. It is complicated. There are, you know, these agreements are in place. I think the Biden administration very much supports the Abraham Accords. I think that the Abraham Accords have enough mo like of momentum of their own at this point that I don't think the UAE is walking away from the Abraham Accords um, over the F-35s. But at the same time, I mean, it's 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 going to be complicated. I also think it's important to keep in mind these arms sales. I mean, the UAE, like the F-35s, I think get delivered in like seven or eight years. And so there's also time to work some of these things out. So um, so like, I guess my bottom line is um, this was meant to be an early signal. It doesn't mean the arms transactions are necessarily canceled and we don't know where that's going to go. And we really have to wait and see what the dynamic in the relationship actually looks like in the long run before you can really judge this. Okay, Unless you have another question, Dov, I want to add if Shira, if Shira allows a third issue on the list of the positives, uh, the security relationship, maintaining it, um, the, the normalization agreements, but also China, I think following Clinton, Bush, and also Obama, the way the U.S., the Trump administration dealt with China and keeping it from totally disrupting the U.S.-Israel relationship is something that was positive and should continue. But only if Shira, who knows much more about that, only if she agrees. I'm going to turn to a question about China in a minute. I want to hear uh, first of all from Shira and then from Tamar. Shira? Um, you know, I, I don't have much to add. I think, you know, despite the transactional nature of these agreements um, and the motivations, notwithstanding, I think uh, the Abraham Accords um, are a great contribution, right? And uh, something that you need to give credit where credit is due. Um, I think that some of the things that are now, that are not great uh, during, and this is, it hasn't started with the Trump administration, but really the Trump administration has enabled it is sort of a, a, a Netanyahu, the prime minister had a monopoly over ties with the US. And I don't know if it's intentional, I'm sure it's intentional that you see um, that the first call between the administration and the Israeli government was between Jake Sullivan and his counterpart, the, the NSC, Mayor Ben Shabbat. And then you have, and you know, Blinken with Ashkenazi, who's not going to stay even in government, right? He's leaving politics. So it's really symbolic act. And then you have um, um, Austin with Gantz, the defense minister. So, so it's interesting that it's more like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this the right way. You can't just like, 
it's you and your CCO and you dispatch to talk to us, your door is open. Um, and I, I think that that's going to be uh, quite interesting. I also agree with Scott. I think on China, um, the Trump administration has, tr has started to tackle this issue in a more serious way. And I think a lot of Democrats would uh, agree. Again, problem with tactics, prioritizing trade issues over the technological competition, which is the real issue. Um, trying to work with allies, but after undermining alliances. <laughs> so this doesn't help you very much. In the Israeli context, there wasn't, um, uh, it, didn't, it didn't get in the way of Israeli-US ties, but it was only, I think, uh, because of pressure coming from the Trump administration, I'm not sure that Israel would respond the same way to pressure by other administrations, that Israel has finally set up um, um, an investment screening committee. Um, to look at foreign investments and primarily Chinese ones. Um, there's a lot of flaws with this committee, but this is a step that I think uh, we should credit the Trump administration. Thank you. Uh, Tamar, this is the- I'd like to make two points here. Uh, one point is regarding the arms sales. I must say that there was a, a significant, quite loud sigh of relief here. Uh, when the F-35 issue uh, uh, was put again on the table because there was a strong uh, opposition within the Israeli security echelons, upper echelons, against this deal. So only this morning, Aus Yadlin was talking uh, on, on, on the Israeli radio and he said, uh, I'm glad that this is being reviewed. So uh, it is not like... Uh, the fact that Netanyahu uh, supported this deal, this was not a consensus amongst Israeli security experts. So uh, it is more complicated than it looks at first sight. And secondly, about the Abraham Accord, uh, it, on top of its political significance, it, uh, it had some very significant psychological effects. Uh, so many Israelis who were uh, actually that they couldn't visit any Arab state in recent years. Egypt is, is it's open uh, formally, but people don't go there. Dubai, the Emirates and so on. People were going there in, in thousands and thousands and it was a good experience for them to uh, have some personal interactions with Arab speaking people, with Arabs who were very hospitable to them. And, and, and this, in a way, may change, uh, 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 I would say, uh, uh, very, very deep-rooted fears uh, uh, from people who speak Arabic and, and, and the fact that uh, they really enjoy their vacations in Dubai and, and elsewhere. And, and, of course, the, all the, the economic ties that were concealed in the past were now put on the table and so many Israeli companies are uh, uh, making deals with, uh, with uh, uh, a variety of, of Arab states. So now the Arab world is not being perceived anymore after the last couple of months as a unified hostile you know, uh, camp that Israel cannot deal with. And particularly the Israeli Arabs, they feel so relieved that they can go uh, there and, and feel welcome, unlike, for example, in Egypt, they are not welcomed in Egypt on, uh, on, uh, for, for the last couple of years. So uh, the psychological effect can be conducive to the relaunching of some talks uh, with the Palestinians in the context of some regional agreement not a bilateral only, but regional. And this may also uh, um, make Israelis less concerned about the only the, these uh, 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 Israeli-Palestinian relations if put in a wider context in which the dividends are much clearer to uh, Israelis than on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, which seems to be perceived as zero gain. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd certainly be very interested tomorrow, and I hope the uh, the Israel Voice Index will will be able over time to kind of study and examine in, in data how these uh, uh, this new openness uh, to the Arab world and these visits to Dubai will change Israeli public opinion uh, and Israeli attitudes towards the region and Israel's place in it in the years to come. 
Um, I want to uh, turn to some more questions that we've had um, coming in. Um, and, and I want to continue to encourage our audience to send in these questions. Um, just uh, on the, uh, the Abraham Accords, a uh, question came in, um, and I think this was specifically for Tamar, um, what are the views of Palestinian citizens of Israel, Arab citizens of Israel, regarding these Abraham Accords? Do you have data on how they see? I know there's been anecdotally, you know, stories of, of uh, Arab citizens of Israel going on holiday, etc. But more broadly, the joint list, I think, opposed these agreements. Yeah. But uh, where, did the, where does the Arab public stand as a whole? Um, very positive, providing, and they always tell that they have this suffix saying, okay, providing that this will not interfere with the efforts to uh, uh, make peace with the Palestinians. But they see it as, as a, a, a new, I would say, a new era in, in many respects. And we should also keep in mind that the Israeli Arabs are uh, in the process of undergoing a, a, a very deep change regarding their ability co to cooperate with uh, a Netanyahu, a right-wing government. It started with uh, Mansour Abbas, but now the, the joint list seems to be you know, collapsing uh, and, and more and more Israeli Arabs or Palestinian Israelis are interested in strengthening, strengthening their, their civil position and, and their civic rights rather than, uh, you know, dealing with the uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. Actually, they blame the Arab members of Knesset for dealing too much with the Palestinian issue rather than dealing with their uh, uh, rights as, as Israeli citizens. Thank you. Um, so I want to um, just one of the following on from our discussion about these normalization agreements and going back to uh, the conversation about the Iran or the issue of Iran and its nuclear program. One of the things that's obviously changed in the current context, uh, unlike back in 2015, is the fact that now, at least publicly, Israel and the UAE and Bahrain now can kind of to some extent, speak with a single voice to the US, right? As they've just done uh, kind of in the last couple of days. I wonder, Ilan, from, do you think that's gonna put more pressure? That's gonna change the Biden administration's calculations now? The fact that you have this public alignment between US allies in the region, Bahrain, the UAE um, and Israel and behind the scenes, I think the Saudis as well. No, look, I actually think it could be a positive opportunity, potentially. I don't really see it as, as, as very negative, partially because, you know, these countries were already quite sort of aligned on the same page back in 2015, even if it wasn't public on this issue. Um, but look, I do think that part of what the U.S. can do as it moves forward and tries to rejoin uh, the JCPOA and build on it, you know, part of what I think the U.S. should do, and I've written about in the past and, and argued for, and I know others have as well, including about a year ago, Jake Sullivan in the in Foreign Affairs, um, you know, was is the idea of, you know, then working with regionally to try to de-escalate tensions and look for ways to create channels between Iran and the Gulf states, Iran and even Israel, like not to, to basically de-escalate different issues and areas of tension in the region, um, and if you can have pro work like that going on in the aftermath um, of any return to JCPOA or other nuclear arrangement, um, but at the same time in parallel, have a channel where as the United States, you're also encouraging greater cooperation between Israel and the Gulf states, um, not in offensive negative ways necessarily, but in positive reassuring ways, um, I actually think it creates more space, um, potentially, you know? Um, I would hope it creates more space. Uh, I think that's kind of what you're trying to do across the region is less violence, less conflict, less state, on, less competition, um, which has really been what's plaguing the region um, and more connections amongst different players with opportunities to do that to me is a good thing. Um, and so that's how I would advise and encourage a, a new team to try to think about all this and, and use the positive momentum out of these things instead of using it as an opportunity to like gang up and escalate and sort of say, we're going to be on these guys' side or that those guys' side, um, you know? Um, I mean, people, there's a lot of discussion 
you know, there has been for a long time in the Middle East about the fact that there's no sort of broader security architecture. There's nothing like the OSCE in the Middle East, right? Like, and because there is no multilateral architecture, it, it leads to more conflict than violence. But like, look, the OSCE only worked because it was a very strong NATO around also and a very strong alliance with partners who work together. And so if you can build the strong, stronger alliances on the one hand between Israel and the Arab states and have mechanisms for de-escalation between Iran and Israel and the Arab states, like, I think it's a good, I think that's a, that's a good recipe, but, you know, remains to be tested. Maybe I'm just, uh, you know, a naive dreamer here, but I think that if you're smart about it and you don't go for the whole enchilada and you just try to look for discrete things that you can do to make progress, like, I think that there's opportunities here. Thank you. And that, that brings me on to what I wanted to ask all of you. And uh, the time that we have remaining is maybe, um, you know, to take a minute or two, if there are particular recommendations that you would like to make, that you think need to, uh, for, the, for what the Biden administration should do, um, or, the, or, or for the Israeli government, in terms of managing this critical relationship with both sides going forward. And we just have, um, I'm just going to ask, put you on the spot, you know, one minute, two minutes, no more. Um, what would be your kind of top recommendation? Scott, we can start with you. Uh, sure. Three things very quick. One, the Biden administration simply needs to succeed. If they succeed in their foreign policy agenda uh, and, and they meet the objectives that they've set about reestablishing America as a strong international voice, um, uh, both in terms of uh, liberalism, liberal institutions, uh, free markets, uh, free societies, um, a, a, an America that's leading globally. I know it sounds a little bit like a bumper sticker, but a strong America. And I'll quote Yaakov Amidror, uh, a conservative Israeli, former national security advisor, who wrote about this in Makor Rishon some years ago. A strong, powerful America that has influence is ultimately in Israel's best interest as well as America. So, the, so number one, they need to succeed. Number two, uh, I think, and here I turn to Tamar, it's a sensitive issue, but there's a liberalism, if I can use a profane word. Um, there's a liberal trends outside and internal. Uh, Israelis worry about their own democracy. I felt it when I lived there, but I also know it from reading Tamar's polls. Israelis have concerns about their own democracy. And if a Biden administration, when needed, can help in pinpoint ways. And the example I would use would be my former boss, Dan Shapiro, and the way he steered the Obama-Biden intervention on the NGO bill. It's a single issue, but it was important at the time. And we, the US, had a big impact on what came out of the Knesset and it was done without triggering Israeli defensiveness. Um, uh, and then third and finally, and here for the Jewish, American Jewish community, I teach at the University of Maryland in a Jewish studies uh, program, uh, depoliticizing the relationship, which I think President Biden already did. Vice President Harris in their campaign, they campaigned on depoliticizing this relationship. In the first week, there's already signals they will. And I think if they continue to depoliticize the alliance, that will be an enormous sigh of relief for the American Jewish community who has found itself imperiled and besieged. I hear it speak more of the leadership over the last four years because their, their core value political strategy for half a century in terms of bipartisanship has been under assault virtually every day for the last four years. Um, so I think um, uh, succeeding globally, um, pinpoint interventions when needed to strengthen Israeli uh, liberal institutions uh, and depoliticizing the relationship. These are, these, the, the, these are ways the new administration will certainly strengthen the relationship. Thank you. Uh, Shira, perhaps uh, you'd like to jump in. Um, sure, um, I had a response, but never mind. I'll put it aside for a second. Um, I would say, I guess, one piece of advice for each side, I think for Israel, um, even though it's hard because Israelis are very blunt, uh, they should refrain for, from uh, taking provocative steps, ones that look like they're pointing a finger in a new administration's eye, an administration that's been very friendly. Everyone's talking about, you know, Biden and B, you know, knowing each other 40 years and having a very genuine friendship. Uh, there's no need to issue tenders for a very controversial uh, uh, uh just a few days before um, inauguration. Uh, likewise, the chief of staff, it's totally out of lane to speak against the U.S. policy going back to an, a, an agreement, uh, even if it makes the prime ministers happy and even if it's going to get you budgets, uh, this is not going to be looked at positively. 
Um, and I think that it is not the most constructive way to begin a relationship with a new administration. And that as, as others here have said, you know, it's a new administration, but with a very, very, very experienced political leadership and the, and the, we see the appointees every, for, for many of them, it's a third term. So um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is really important. I would say also uh, a little bit of humility I've heard Israelis in private conversation saying, oh no, when they come here, we need to explain to them that they can't go back because Iran is not Iran. It's just like, you know, uh, it's not uh, people that came from, I don't want to say anything um, offensive, but it's not like the, the, the people that uh, made decisions uh, around Trump that came with no background in international affairs. Those people are experienced. Uh, they know they show us. So a little bit of humility explaining to them. I think um, in terms of the United States, uh, there's a tendency to see uh, Israel as Netanyahu. He's been prime minister the longest time. Uh, he's been, uh, he, he has a monopoly over the ties with, with, uh, with the United States. And, you know, it's very uh, natural that the policy would come from him. I think it would be wise, and I understand there's no bandwidth for this now, uh, but it would be wise to keep cultivating relationships not just uh, the formal channels, uh, NEC level, uh, State Department level, but also with others, uh, both Gidon Saar and Aftali Bennett. They're more hawkish than Netanyahu, I would say, on many issues. Uh, but as Tamar said, they um, indicated uh, their willingness and their desire to solve conflicts with the, with the administration uh, uh, behind closed doors. They're not going to give a speech in Congress if they're unhappy. And I think it would be wise also for the U.S. to try to cultivate these relationships for the administration. Thank you. And Tamar? My first recommendation is don't do anything right now. Uh, the, the political scene is too overloaded and the, the uh, tension over domestic and, 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 and health and economic issues is such that there would be no openness, at least on the Israeli side, to start dealing again with a, a, a new peace initiative. And when a new peace initiative is put on the table, one should keep in mind, and this is something that uh, was recommended at the time when the Kerry uh, initiative was on the table. Please recall that for many Israelis, there is also the fear that if a peace agreement is signed and borders will be open with the, the neighboring country, then uh, we are about to see, uh, again, relocation of factories and industries to Irby, Jordan, to wherever, and people lost their jobs. They do not uh, uh, forget that it was very costly for them, the lower middle classes, uh, 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 people, at, at, at the blue colored people, they, they remember that Delta was uh, 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 relocated, other industries were relocated. So the economic uh, outcomes for uh, uh, the people who are not uh, going to benefit for it because they are not, uh, you know, great businessmen. And so uh, this will be taken into consideration. Last but not least, read other uh, media channels and newspapers rather than Haaretz in English. Because sometimes when I meet American officials, they only quote Haaretz. They should read Makori Shon, they should read other, uh, uh, you know, written and, 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 and other kinds of uh, political columns in order to really get the sense what is happening here rather than to speak with people that they are accustomed to speak with. Thank you. And finally, uh, Ilan. Sure. Well, I'll be very quick. For, for the Israeli side, I would echo Shira's recommendation, especially I'll, I'll focus on Iran. Like, try to go the pathway of working with the Americans, even if you know there's going to be disagreements. There's no need for a repeat of 2015. I don't think that ended well for anybody. Um, you know, and I think everybody's interests are better served uh, be, you know, um, with 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 a, with a pathway where the U.S. and Israel can work together, um, and for the United States, I think also take the lessons out of 2015 um, and like the tensions with Israel over the JCPOA. So from 
from the beginning, telegraph through words and actions that even if it's going back into the JCPOA or building on it, that it's not just going to be that, that there is going to be a major effort on regional issues and other concerns, like listen to those concerns from the Israeli side. Um, and, um, you know, and, and just be open throughout the process on really respecting and understanding why this other anxiety is coming from the region, um, you know, and, and trying to build that, like, looking for those areas of cooperation from the very beginning. Um, so that even if we have some disagreements over tactics, I think at the end of the day, like all of us are looking for, you know, preventing Iran from moving towards a nuclear weapon. All of us want a more stable region. Um, and I think that there's a lot we can do together to get there, so. Thank you. So I wanna um, uh, thank all of you for your really smart analysis and sharp insights and sage advice. Um, and I'm just going to uh, turn now over to uh, my colleague, Paul Sham, the director of the Guildenhorn Institute for Israel Studies, to uh, close the event. And on behalf of myself and the Nazarene Centre, thank you all and thank you all for joining us. Paul. I thank you, uh, Dov. And I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the Guildenhorn Institute, just thank the uh, participants for their incredibly illuminating discussion of issues we're all in many ways familiar with, but putting them in a context that I think will uh, help illuminate what will be happening over the uh, coming months and uh, years. And I particularly uh, appreciated your uh, sage advice in the last few minutes. And uh, I will have to think about the uh, recommendation to uh, go beyond my beloved uh, art and uh, actually see what the other half or 90% actually reads. So thanks again. I appreciate uh, all of your wisdom and I look forward to working with you all again. And let's hope that the election and the next few years can go smoothly. They, they will if policy makers take your advice. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, and uh, see you next time. Thanks.